Good morning and welcome to Mental Health in Sport, Kicking Stigma Into Touch webinar. My name is Genevieve Glover and I'm Managing Director of Morsey Learning. Just a little bit about Morsey Learning before we start. Morsey Learning is a subsidiary of Morsey Charity and we have a strategic vision of providing and supporting world-class and accessible learning in mental health and well-being. We have three great speakers for the webinar today, but before I introduce them to you, I'd just like to introduce the webinar itself. Sir John Kirwan, Marcus Trisrothic, Clara Hughes, Frank Bruno, David Beckham, Mike Tyson, Ian Thorpe, and many more from this League of Champion Athletes have two things in common, a successful sporting career and a history of a quiet battle with a mental health issue. Apart from these testimonies, there are many like Robert Enker, Justin Fashnu, and Gary Speed, whose tales are tragic. The culture of sport is known for its bravado and celebration of tough veneers. Elite athletes and champions are considered athletic heroes in macho professions, devoid of mental weaknesses like depression or anxiety, hardened and well-oiled sporting machines trained to perform to the highest athletic standards. Sports people define strength, and the message we draw from various athletes who have spoken about their troubles with mental illnesses is that your mental strength has nothing to do with it, shifting focus of athletes from being supernatural icons into fallible people. It is this simple act of sharing that makes such an impact. This webinar is to facilitate this act of sharing and attacking the stigma which forces people to retreat and keep their depression buried, forcing them to live in misery, misery and sometimes take their own lives. What we hope to do in this webinar is firstly discuss the unique pressures experienced by modern day professional sports people, understand the reason for stigma in mental health specific to elite sports, and thirdly explore ways to have the difficult conversation about mental health illnesses. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ian Braid, who is Chief Executive Officer of the British Athletes Commission. This is a members association for elite athletes who predominantly have represented their country in either Olympic or Paralympic sports. His focus is very much on athlete welfare and ensuring athletes are best represented collectively and individually in high performing sport, giving them every opportunity to excel. His passion for sport is illustrated in his additional activities, which include being a trustee of sports aid, chairing the National Awards Committee and being a non-executive director of Sports Resolutions UK, sitting as a member of the Panel and Appointments Review Committee. Over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Good morning, everybody. What, what I'd like to do in my presentation is the following. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the BAC and then talk to you about where the pressure on elite athletes come from, what could be the consequences of that pressure, and then finally, what can be done and some concluding remarks. Association, they number around 1500, 1600, and they are predominantly, but not exclusively, athletes who are in Olympic and Paralympic sports and are at the top of the game or very, very closely to the, to the top, world-class or world-class potential. What is our mission? Our mission is all about the athletes that we represent and we strive to give them a voice in the governance of their sports. We do this in a non-adversarial way, preferring to work through collaboration and negotiation with all the relevant stakeholders, which includes the relevant national governing bodies, the NGBs and their staff. What are our goals? Goal one is to provide a triage service of advice, support and guidance for our members. The life of a young, high-performance athlete can be a lonely one, especially when the system in which he or she operates is pressurised and built around excellence, success and consistent high performance. In this environment, it's important that the athletes have someone to turn to who will respect them, treat them as individuals and provide appropriate advice, support and guidance in a confidential manner outside of the system but linked to it. 
Our second goal is to establish an active network of athlete representatives in the recognised sports of the BAC. This is important for two reasons. Firstly, it gives the BAC a focal point as required and we appoint them depending upon the size and the structure of the high performance units in these sports. Secondly, we use the appointed rep network as a support group to enable these people to share ideas and good practice and again, not to make them feel alone. Goal three is that we are the voice of the membership community and we engage with all of the stakeholders who have an influence on the membership and the sporting landscape in which they train and compete. And finally, we strive to continually improve the governance of the BAC so that the organisation is sustainable and we manage risks and grow, diversifying our income whilst retaining a focus on the mission and the interests and welfare of our members. So, where does the pressure on our, mem on our members come from? Performance, and I guess we must recognise in this that, that pressure could be a good thing. But there's lots of ways in which pressure impacts in a performance way. Training, competing, self-imposed pressure, fear of failure or the drive to succeed being watched by coaches and performance staff, consistently monitored and measured. And this in an environment which is sponsored by UK Sport who have a philosophy of no compromise. I'll give you a quote from a, a, a fellow membership association, the Professional Cricketers Association. As an elite athlete, your career is only an injury or a selector's decision away from being over. The culture in high performance sports varies. In many, it's a fear culture. There's a lack of voice. The performance staff aren't necessarily leaders, but are figures of authority. Our members are young and not necessarily able to operate or manage the system. They have to conform. And in many cases, performance staff can struggle to treat athletes as an individual. Here's an obvious one, when they're injured, it doesn't have to be a career-ending injury, but it can impact on their ability to be trained and to be seen. Our members are very active, so if they're inactive, rehab can be very stressful. Selection. Selection policies are not always well communicated and understood. What do I need to do and by when? Policies are not necessarily fair or open, and when it comes to an appeal, there's always a small window of opportunity in which to demonstrate a case. The case can involve costs and money is not, easily, not necessarily easily accessible to athletes on limited finance. There's a great sense of frustration. Appeals are often only allowed on whether the policy or procedure has been followed. The British Athletes Commission would argue that the policy or procedure wasn't necessarily fair in the first place. Funding. Most BAC members receive athletes' personal allowances through national lottery funding. And there's no doubt that this has actually transformed performance sport in this country. But it's still a struggle and athletes really do have to watch their finances. I've found that when I need to engage with the members and involve them in events that the BAC runs, the offer of free food obviously gets engagement. Equality. The BAC is committed to equality because of the diversity of our membership. But in the time that I've been chief executive, I have seen or I'm dealing with now cases of sexual discrimination, racial discrimination, disability discrimination. And again, that comes back to the culture of the sport in which the athletes operate. And transition, finally. Transition means when the career of an elite athlete is coming to an end. And that may, that may be by choice, retirement, or it could be enforced injury or deselection. The athletes have competed in a very structured environment. They've been told what to do, where to be, what to eat, when to sleep, when to get up, etc, etc. Very similar in many ways to, uh, to the fantastic people who leave the military after serving our country. Now they find themselves with lots of free time, lots of independence, and not necessarily sure what to do, either today, tomorrow, or in a career. Do they have the appropriate plans in place? 
Lastly, and I haven't put it on the slide, but for many of our members who are in the, in the Paralympic community, then they have to go through classification exercises or reclassification that enables them to compete in their sports. This is an area where I'm seeing increasingly lots of cases and the stress that it, that it has on the athletes knowing not knowing whether they're going to be able to compete in Rio or South Korea or whatever again is incredibly stressful what can be the consequences well clearly these are high performing individuals high performing athletes there can be an impact on performance for a university actually has a special research unit looking at elite, uh, eating disorders in elite athletes. Again, uh, just as an addition, as I thought about on my way to, the, uh, to this webinar today, the effect of pressure could be a temptation to take prohibitive substances in order to be able to continue to compete. So, what can be done? There's an organization uh, in elite sport called the England Institute for Sport and there's, there's similar facilities in Wales and Scotland and they run a team of people called performance lifestyle advisors that are there for the athletes. This is great but there is a perception amongst the athlete community that the EIS, the England Institute for Sport, is a part of the system. But we're beginning to work closely with EIS now and in many cases, they are signposting the British Athletes Commission to the athletes who approach them. Because we, the BAC, are purely about the athletes and the welfare of our members. There are, however, cost restrictions for the athletes who are not on lots of money. And it is important that we find the right people for them to turn to. The BAC itself is not uh, overburdened by finance and resource but we are looking as part of our triage service to start to build relationships through organizations such as the Professional Players Federation which also counts the members associations in cricket, football, rugby, golf, snooker etc etc in their membership and it's through this that we have built a relationship with Michael Bennett and his organization Unique Sports Counseling and Michael will be speaking at the conference next month. We are at the minute, as we speak, surveying our members as part of a, our contribution to this Maudsley Learning Initiative. And we will look forward to announcing our results at the conference on the 17th of July. As a result of this survey, I'm hoping that it might lead to be a catalyst where more funds are released and more support can be gained once we understand the scale of the issue that's in front of us. And finally, if I may, some concluding remarks. I would say that the British Athletes Commission is important, but, it, but as we begin to build our profile now, lots of sports are also recognizing the importance of the fact that the athletes should have somebody to turn to. So we continue to build our triage service either to help remove stress by dealing with grievances or to refer our members to athlete mentors or other professional help. This transition area is very key and with the BAC and our triage service we are looking to increase our responsibility in this area. My argument both personally and professionally is that sport has a moral responsibility to our elite athletes but who pays? And this area, once a career is finished for an athlete, is moot. But if transition is dealt with better, more elite athletes might stay in sport and help the development of the talent pathway and future success, and in our case, that means in Olympic and Paralympic sports in 2016 and onwards. For me, as the chief executive of a relatively small organization, collaboration is key. We need to work together to help to raise the profile of this issue and create the solutions. So for me, 
I'm delighted and privileged to be able to speak at this webinar today on behalf of my membership. And I hope that this leads also to the success of the conference, which is also key in raising the profile. And hopefully the BAC will be part of a sustained initiative going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian, for, uh, for your presentation there. I understand that uh, those that are dialing in uh, lost about two minutes of his presentation. Not to worry, we will make sure that you will get copies of the full webinar so you can capture um, all of his presentation. You now have around 20 seconds to send through your questions um, that I will pose um, to Ian, and then we'll pass on to our second speaker. So um, I have a question here, which I will bring up. There we go. Let's just maximize that. So a question here, as the physical ability is screened for selection, is a potential player's mental fitness screened? That's a question for you, Ian. Uh, yes, it is. There's a lot of um, sports science surrounding all of our elite athletes in whatever sports they are, and that includes um, sports psychologists. So yes, it is mental and physical well-being. The ability to perform under pressure is key. So yes, uh, yeah, I'm a firm believer anyway that the mental health and physical health are inextricably linked, and so are the uh, so are the people in high performance sport. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, the sorts of issues that the British Athletes Commission um, are approached with and, and support athletes in addressing, in terms of sort of physical and, and, and mental health issues, are you finding that there's a, an increase in, in mental issues that are, that are being raised with you? Um, we have had a number of cases. Um, I had a case last year where an athlete was under a, a considerable amount of pressure and felt it was affecting him mentally. I found out later, he told his coach that he wanted to go and see his doctor to, to uh, have some treatment. His coach told him, in no way are you going to see your GP, you tell nobody about this issue. He was very brave in coming forward and I think it was because he trusted the confidentiality of the BAC that he did so. Um, I just know it's around anecdotally, but I hope that the survey that we do will actually give us some proper empirical evidence to prove it. Fantastic. And as you mentioned, Ian, that, that uh, evidence that is being um, sought as we speak will be presented at the conference on the 17th of July. Uh, another question that's come through, how large is post-retirement employment opportunity for elite sports men and women who wish to transition and stay involved? Well, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure I, un, I fully understand the question, but, I, I, but I'll give it a bash. The, um, the, there are lots of things in place or starting to become in place. The BAC works in a, uh, in a collaboration with the British Olympic Association and the BPA and Dame Kelly Holmes Legacy Trust and, and are starting to think about putting on more things like career stairs, etc., for our athletes. And I think that's fine, but the focus that I want the BAC to take is actually um, the mental aspects as well, uh, because the first two, ki first two years after an athlete leaves their sport is proven to be key. So we can give them physical opportunities, but I also want to give them an opportunity to come to us to seek mental support. And they can be a member of the BAC for as long as they want, and, and as long as they pay the subscriptions, clearly. But the uh, and then they can have whatever advice and support that they want. I hope that answers the question. It does. That's fantastic. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Now, on to our second speaker, uh, Nick Peters. Nick is a, a clinical psychotherapist and a former professional cricketer at Surrey Cricket Club. His interest in mental health, emotional and psychological well-being began, and I quote, as an emotionally underdeveloped and psychologically immature 20-year-old grappling with the on-field and off-field pressures of professional sport. As a clinician, he works on three levels. As a counselor psychologist, offering short-term goal-orientated work, which aims to provide symptom relief, reduction, and management. As a psychotherapist, focusing on in-depth processes to identify the root causes of the emotional and psychological difficulties, leading towards long-term healing and transformation. And finally, as a mentor psychologist, focusing on the pursuit of excellence and peak performance. Now, Nick is going to start his presentation with a video. Um, I would advise you to um, reduce the volume on your own sort of personal laptops and computers because it is quite loud. 
Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Genevieve. Good morning to all of you. Just before the video, a very brief introduction. A warm welcome to my presentation, a stigma around uh, mental health and elite sport. I'm of the firm belief that at the heart of this matter concerning stigma, mental health and elite sport is a fundamental conflict, and it is this. On the one hand, elite sportsmen and sportswomen are pursuing their ultimate winning formula, a concoction of mental toughness, self-control, invincibility, strength and perfection. Sporting attributes exemplified in the following video clip, as Genevieve says, it'd be a good idea to put your volume down. Out there, it was a war. You were just seeing something totally brutal. I intend to make them grovel. Series. I can remember Clive said never again. But underneath these heroic displays of sporting excellence, we have the unavoidable truth that these sporting icons are innately mortal, vulnerable, and fallible human beings, just like the rest of us. They are human beings playing at being superheroes, and this just isn't sustainable. Let's briefly consider a few basic differences between the winning mindset and the psychotherapeutic approach to mental health. The winning mindset is really about controlling thoughts and feelings specifically to create positive mental states to avoid uncomfortable or negative ones. Mental health, on the other hand, is about a movement towards or an embracing of all mental states, particularly uncomfortable, darker, more vulnerable ones such as anxiety, fear, anger and shame, etc. The theory behind this notion is the paradoxical theory of change. Taking a look at figure one, starting at the arrow. We come into awareness of a feeling, such as sadness. We mobilize contact with it and decide to stay with the feeling. Then we move towards the action stage by feeling the sadness more acutely. Next, we make final contact through crying. And finally, we reach the satisfaction stage where the sadness has been processed through the release of tears. The cycle begins again. Hence, we have a wave-like pattern. As one need is satisfied, another need emerges. And now to some outcomes. So we begin with the uncomfortable feeling states, again, such as anxiety, anger, shame. These are feelings and emotions that all human beings naturally experience. If we embrace them, we can learn to tolerate and subsequently process them, leading ultimately towards an integrated sense of self and consequently enhanced performance. However, if we avoid them through denial, repression, unhealthy coping strategies such as alcohol, obsessive behaviors and addiction, etc., we move towards mental illness such as depression and mental disorders, psychosomatic issues. Even some physiological illnesses such as heart attacks, cancer and arthritis have their roots in unprocessed psychological emotional material. So, what are the human costs of taking the wrong path? Well, let's consider the case of John Cohen the all-black rugby great.
As the video footage shows, the cost is dramatic. There is an alarming contrast between the magnificent display of the on-field performance persona and his suicidal thoughts, night sweats of his depression. Out the other side, John Cohen tells us of the ultimate lesson he has learned, the danger of avoiding difficult feelings and the importance of embracing them. In this case, how vulnerability and feelings such as sadness can be processed through tears. I like the idea of emotional sweating as opposed to the physical sweating that elite sportsmen and sportswomen are so good at. Whilst elite sportsmen and sportswomen develop their physical muscles, there is a need here for them to develop their emotional muscles. Here we have a few more examples of the mental health cost of not processing feelings effectively. Mark former England cricket captain, psychoanalyst and psychotherapist, comments on the significance of the impact of the unconscious psychological processes on the human psyche. Um, a few more interesting facts. One in particular. Um, I found a, a reading through the New Zealand Herald and I came across an enlightening fact not shown on the slide and it reports that 20 out of 100 professional cricketers um, have used mental health programs and there are others who would like to help this help if they had the opportunity. If 20 out of 100 New Zealand professionals are seeking mental health, one wonders how many professional cricketers might require similar psychological help in the English county game and indeed in other domestic competitions across the world. Here we have the split between the performance per se and the authentic self. The darker um, authentic real self circle represents how unprocessed dissociated feelings get split off and pushed into the unconscious. Michael Brearley again highlights the need for authenticity. He says that these men lose their authenticity and that humiliation which contrasts dramatically with the excitement and success that went before can be terrible. On to another theoretical point. Figure four reveals how the process of integration works. The clinician works with the client to expand his or her window of tolerance in order to integrate dissociated components of the psyche in conscious awareness. This helps the client to self-regulate difficult feelings, to clarify and organize cognitions, and to develop mentalization skills. An integrated coherent sense of self should look like figure five. Where the circles intersect shows how previously dissociated phenomena have become integrated. The feelings such as vulnerability, anxiety, shame and anger, for example, are no longer in the unconscious. They are brought into conscious awareness. There will always be an unconscious component, but the more conscious we become, the more integrated and psychologically healthy we are. Um, we come finally to a my model of a performance model um, which talks about the need to integrate mental states um, and we've got for example a relationship breakdown from circle A will impact on the group dynamic circle B and then A and then vice versa. In, in summary sports psychology can help foster a winning mindset which is required for the on-field performance state while psychotherapy is required to promote mental health and wellness for the off-field states. Psychotherapeutic intervention should be firstly developed by clinicians who have an integrated training and expertise, in particular an in-depth training of unconscious psychological processes. It should be very early and it should be confidential. In summary, there needs to be education and awareness of the different psychological approaches to winning. Um, secondly, elite sportsmen and sportsmen need a combination of sports psychology and psychotherapeutic intervention. Thirdly, all sports clubs and communities of elite sport should integrate psychotherapists as part of their training program as a means of firstly nurturing elite sportsmen and sportsmen's mental health, which thus helps enhance their overall elite performance. Thank you very much. And over to you, Genevieve. Fabulous. Thank you for that, Nick. Um, interesting. I love the idea of developing emotional muscles. Um, 
while um, while we're waiting for people to send through their questions, I mean, just just a question from me on on the emotional muscles. Uh, I mean, you've obviously given a, a sort of overview um, for elite sports men and women and how they might approach it personally as part of their clubs. But do you have any say, um, sort of anonymous, obviously practical case studies of people that you've worked with to help them develop their emotional muscles to become a, a better elite sports person? Um, yeah, I think a lot of it really is to do with um, going through what I call core processing. Um, as, as I've talked about the um, figures um, with regards the theory of paradoxical theory of change, it's about working with athletes to come into contact with very, very painful emotions and feelings. And it's only by coming into contact of these painful emotional feelings that they learn to tolerate them and therefore develop their emotional muscles, which is very much counterintuitive to what the elite sports athlete is doing because the elite sports athlete is not allowed to feel anxiety. The elite athlete is trying to monitor or control anxiety, whereas in the clinical room, the clinician is actually trying to help the client get in touch with the anxiety. So the more anxiety the clinician feels in the room, the better because then the client has the opportunity to experience the anxiety and therefore develop the muscles to tolerate it and process it. I hope that yeah. answers your question. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, a further question that's, that's come through. Um, Nick, what is your view on the recent allegations about Marcus Triscothic having burnout as opposed to a mental health disorder? I was wondering where this had come up. Um, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I think at the end of the day, it's it's... The definitions here have got slightly complicated, but the point is, is that um, I think it's Jonathan Trotz. Um, he, he, he suffered from psychological and emotional issues. Whether or not it was depression or burnouts, I think we can get caught up in the in the argument. But the point is, is that he needed intervention. Um, if he had psychotherapy alongside sports psychology, then it basically would have helped him deal with the process. The problem with Jonathan Schrott is that this case is that intervention, in my view, came too late. You know, when he came back to the UK, he was put in touch with some very good conditions. But had he been, had he been uh, involved in a psychotherapeutic process before the Ashes tour, then the likelihood of him breaking down would have been minimized, in my view. So it's a question of at what stage the intervention comes. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be a sport that needs to be intervention for sports psychologists for the on-field the performance and for the life, all the other issues, because they spill over. They're not separate entities. Um, so there needs to be help all round from a very early point. Sure. Does and that, that, and actually, oh. that leads um, very well into, into the next question. Um, all sports clubs and communities of elite sports should integrate with psychotherapists. But if they don't, what will make them do so? That's an excellent question. Um, I thoroughly, this is obviously what my presentation is about. Psychotherapists need to be integrated into the frame. Um, if they don't do that, well, hopefully this conference and this seminar will be the first stage to, um, to that particular step. But I, I suspect and I'm confident that that will happen. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Okay. Right, we're now moving on to our third and final speaker, uh, Dr. Phil Cooper. Now, Phil is a nurse consultant in dual diagnosis at Five Boroughs Partnership NHS Foundation Trust and developed the Feel Good, Play Better, Live Well education and awareness session with the support of his colleague, Carol Ead. Phil works with service users who have mental ill health and who also misuse drugs, alcohol or both. Phil has delivered the player awareness presentation to all Super League clubs, championship clubs and now with community clubs, helping players to identify how they can improve their mental well-being and encouraging them to ask for help if they need it. Welcome, Phil. Over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Do appreciate it. And it's been great to listen to Ian and uh, Nick as well. So, okay, um, we'll move to the presentation if that's okay. All right, okay, you know who I am. I'm one of the co founders of um, State of Mind alongside the introduction. And the presentation today is about how we've perhaps tried to have some of those difficult conversations within a, a variety of sports clubs. Uh, it's interesting listening to both of my colleagues today talking about. Uh, introducing psychotherapy and stuff into sporting clubs because uh, silence is one of the biggest enemies perhaps of sports people across the world and, and certainly in terms of men and males playing sport. Uh, this was sort of brought to our attention massively really um, uh, with the un unfortunate uh, death of Terry Newton who took his own life in September 2010. 
Uh, it prompted a group of healthcare professionals, uh, such as myself, who are massive rugby league fans, uh, and we got together and joined up with the two former Great Britain players and Sky Television presenters who both played with Terry, uh, and we invited key individuals and organisations to get together. And what we found is we gathered evidence that identified in all the top rugby league clubs in the in the UK, the areas where the, the Super League clubs played, the suicide rates were higher than the national average. So for those people who don't know, I'll tell you what the state of mind is. It's a, it's a mental health well-being initiative to provide support for rugby league players and their fans who don't access help. Uh, we tried to reduce suicide by targeting vulnerable groups of males and their families. And we've worked with a range of partners to try to deliver awareness raising options, focusing on mental fitness, which again has been mentioned a couple of times this morning already. So what we're trying to do is work massively in partnership with a whole range of different people across the whole sport rather than in an individual club. Uh, so we enlisted the great support of the Rugby Football League, who've allowed us to have four rounds of fixtures in the top division in the last four years that are themed around state of mind and mental fitness. Uh, we've built up great relationships with the Super League Players Association uh, and done some work with the professional players, worked with Sport Relief and Rugby League Cares, the charity of the um, Rugby League. Uh, the picture in the, at the bottom in the middle is a, a player from a community club in St. Helens, Hare's Finch Club, who uh, sport our logo on their warm-up tops. And we've worked with Cambridge University, a project in Barnsley with cricket and football, and also with a number of NHS college, colleagues across the, uh, the country, such as Bordesley, of course, today, and Sky Sports. So the key ingredients to what we've tried to do is have a great passion and enthusiasm to build momentum, uh, to engage with key individuals and org organizations collaboratively. Uh, we try to involve people and uh, give them some ownership in the project try to look across the horizon for short, medium, and long-term goals for the project, and raising profile, influencing, and promoting change um, with that, a range of partners. So some of the ingredients, we try to have broader messages that encourage local responses, certainly from health communities and uh, public health bodies. We try to communicate and keep as many people in the loop as possible build up great media links with both broadcast journalists and uh, written uh, journalists, and try to be opportunistic specifically, to take advantage of any opportunity that crops up, such as this webinar, for example. We try to link all our work alongside national policy as well, uh, and agendas, and if you're not aware, State of Mind has been cited as, a, as an exemplar of good practice in the updated UK Suicide Prevention Guide in 2014 to access males in particular locations. Build on what evidence exists, evaluate it, and celebrate what we do. So if you think about the slide with uh, a men are initially not talking, there are a number of different facts that you may or may not be aware of that should really encourage men to talk. So for example, uh, men are far less likely to seek help with medical problems. Depressed mood occurs just as often in men as in women but women are twice as likely to be diagnosed and treated. And the stat that really sort of uh, shocked us really was that 77% of all suicides in England and Wales are male, and suicide is the biggest killer of men aged 15 to 50, according to the Office of National Statistics. So in terms of state of mind, we, we needed to have a currency to try and have difficult conversations in an environment which is exceedingly macho in terms of the top level sporting uh, rugby league clubs. So we tried to have an awareness raising, but we needed credibility. So we always try to go for credibility to build a reputation about what we're going to do and try to get peer to peer recommendation to allow those difficult conversations to actually take place. Now, as part of the build up to the first round of fixtures in 2011, uh, we uh, delivered education sessions to all the top Super League clubs, to all the top players, before that round of fixtures took place. So they all knew what we were trying to do. And that peer recommendation has come from so many different players, A, because we were helping them out in the clubs, but also we had a target to meet the needs of fans and officials, 
and everybody working in clubs, not just players, that everyone seemed to buy into the project and what we were trying to do. When we go in, into sports clubs, the hook for players, again, has been touched on by Ian and Nick, with the sports performance improves when you're actually mentally fit and the body achieves what the mind believes in terms of the difference between winning and losing. In terms of my own role in the NHS, it was a great opportunity, A, to get a load of uh, autographs from players, but also the chance to use motivational interviewing, brief interventions looking at anxiety, depressed mood, alcohol and drug misuse to encourage conversations. Now, I tried to offer help to players in ways that they would actually access, because we didn't really know what they would access. And the governing body in League 13 Players Association, alongside a, a range of different groups, will provide different opportunities for help. So we, we like to think we've been a bit innovative as well. We, we know it's never been done in British Rugby League before. As far as we're aware, there's no other sport in the UK that's themed around the fixtures for mental well-being. So it'd be nice for Aviva Premiership or Premier Football, perhaps, to join up at some point to do something similar. Uh, we delivered the project direct to players, officials, fans, and now communities about mental well-being, but we use the players to do that. And our partners saw an opportunity to harness sport and mental health using a novel approach to get to this really vulnerable group that's difficult to get to in terms of males and the families around them. And we deliver sessions in sports clubs before or after training. So we go in an evening, so yeah, getting psychotherapy or anybody involved needs to be on the terms of the club, perhaps in community situations. We, we, we like to think we're quite, quite cool on uh, Twitter. Uh, we use players to uh, send out messages in the 10 days before a round of fixtures, accessing over 4 million potential followers last year in, in the messages that we, we got out via the players, uh, using our website to provide information about support. So has the project made a difference? Well, we certainly think so. Uh, it's gained national and international recognition. Uh, the all-party parliamentary rugby league group are very supportive. Uh, the National Rugby League in Australia have launched their What's Your State of Mind campaign, Time with State of Origin, uh, a couple of weeks ago for their second year. We've been over to the University of Cork to deliver sessions in GAA and Rugby Union. And we're off to meet the health minister in Dublin uh, in September around using the approach across uh, GAA. So there's about 3,900 players, officials, fans, students, pupils, and even prisoners now who've accessed the education sessions, with 85% of them never accessing mental health training before. So what we do know is that state of mind saves lives. The numerous examples, be it in clubs, uh, community clubs, or in the top level of sport, where we've been able to help and prevent a suicide by people having those really difficult conversations. One life saved was always our justification for starting the project. You can see Kevin Sinfield, the England Rugby League captain, warming up there. And again, we've delivered sessions for football, cricket, GAA, and rugby union. So the potential's huge. So it's great listening to my colleagues and how we might sort of work together for the future. State of Mind's an award-winning campaign. Uh, and the State of Mind is the phrase that's become associated in getting support in rugby league, which is great. Being mentally fit is becoming the norm and opening the conversation to actually enable that difficult conversation to become much easier for a whole range of rugby league players. So we, we engage community clubs like Newton Storm with the young kids. We're trying to get to the youngest children as well to get state of mind and mental fitness embedded in their, their routines of training. Bradford Bulls players and obviously uh, George Riley from Radio 5 Live. So some of our future goals to try to build on add to and strengthen partnership working, inform and influence new health service groups across the UK in the suicide prevention strategy. Uh, round 25 in Super League, which is the end of August this year, again, is a state of mind round, and there'll be a range of activities. Our Twitter ambassadors are growing. Uh, we're developing guidance on key stresses and problems for clubs and health and wellbeing policies. We're going to continue with our education and training programs and launch and maximize our new films. So uh, my last slide in terms of takeaway points about engaging that difficult conversation is working partnership a whole, across a whole sport was quite daunting initially, but we've managed to harness a whole range of different people, and local health communities can latch onto that whole sport approach. Learn from other people's approaches, 
challenge your own approaches and use fresh thinking to advocate positive practice, get simple acceptable messages out there, understand your audience or audiences and men sometimes may require a different approach. But that upstream thinking is crucial to improving health outcomes, preventing crisis. So I'll shut up now and I will uh, let you watch the film that's uh, around this year's campaign about the state of mind family and the support teams around every individual. It's kind of seen as a big macho sport. We're supposed to be these big, tough rugby league players who have no emotions. Every second, the next tackle could be the one that finishes you. Mental health is your ability to deal with the ups and downs of life, realistically. The fact when you go on operations, a couple of guys and that lot are not going to come back with you. The mental strain is unreal. I've been relegated, I've been through administration. I had to have spinal surgery. I was engaged to a girl who died of cancer. I'm going through a divorce and it's not very nice. I've suffered from depression for 12 years and was borderline suicidal. A phone call to a friend stopped me doing something stupid. If you are strong enough to talk about it, there's always someone there that will listen. Rugby League in general is one big family and we look out for each other. I've had a bad day at school or something, like playing rugby and it calms me down a bit. That's the bond that, that rugby league players have with each other, they're always there to help each other. It's awesome to be a part of the sport, everyone's real close. The state of mind family. Belong. Fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Phil. Uh, much appreciated. Um, and a great video at the end as well. Um, as with the previous questions, you have 20 seconds to, uh, to present your questions, which I will share with Phil. I'm just going to... I had a question myself, actually. Um, I mean, obviously, as you say, you, you sort of perceive to be quite innovative in terms of um, your sort of international recognition for what, what you've been doing at State of Mind. I was just wondering what lessons you've learned along the way so that when other sports and sporting bodies decide to raise their game, pardon the pun, um, on sort of mental health and mental toughness, you know, what, what can they take away from, from today's webinar and from your experience to make sure that they perhaps do it right first time? A really good question, I think, Genevieve. Uh, I think being very focused on your sports and knowing your sport very, very well. Rugby league is a, a specific sport and knowing that sport and having fans or professionals who know the sport inside out can certainly help to get into those clubs. Uh, players, whether they're professionals or in a community situation, will know you've got an, uh, an, an excitement about the sport that you actually watch. So we're using people in cricket, in rugby union, vitally important. And anything that you can do to get those fantastic pieces of work that happen in individual clubs. So mind, I've done work with Wasps. I know cricket do mind, mind matters. Getting all that across a whole sport is probably crucial to a much bigger impact, I would imagine. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I mean, another question that's come up for you, for you again, Phil. Um, does the media help in creating awareness and credibility to have a difficult conversation about mental health? You know, what has your, been your experience of that? Massively so. We, we really tried to foster our relationships with media partners, um, so much so that last year we were able to have a player from each club on their own club website talk about some of the difficult times they've had in their life, not just necessarily with depression or mental health issues, but about split relationships, being dropped from particular games, and using those examples that supporters will certainly identify with, can certainly help people to begin to talk. I remember once going to the Huddersfield Giants and doing a session at 8.30 in the morning and having some feedback a couple of weeks later from their captain saying in their career they'd played for about five or six clubs but had never spoken about mental fitness at all. And after we'd delivered the session in the club, they'd actually all been talking about all the issues that actually faced them and uh, affected the way they performed or trained. And that was a re really crucial sort of goal for ourselves to get that conversation going into. Yeah. There's a question that's come through here um, referencing rugby league and also union. Um, has there increased professionalism, physicality and number of concussions in rugby league and union led to an increase in mental health issues? That's a re again a really topical question at this point in time. I think Shantane Harper year recently spoke about concussion and the, the impact that had on his career both played rugby league and union. Um, I think it's a, an emerging sort of uh, field at this point in time. I know the rugby league have introduced specific guidelines around concussion, just as Rugby Union did, I think, in the last two years as well. 
Uh, I think there'll be long-term potential impacts of that. But again, I think we need to sort of look at that in a little bit more depth. But there are potential issues in, I think, in American football that have come to light. So I think it'll be an issue for the future, without a doubt. Sure. Thank you. Fantastic. What I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all our speakers, that's Ian, Nick and Phil. Um, and if you have any feedback, then do send them through via the chat pod and we'll make sure that those are recorded. Um, as you were probably aware, this webinar is a, is a precursor to our Game Changing in Mental Health Conference, which is taking place on the 17th of July here at the Autos Learning and Event Centre in Camberwell. This is a one-day conference organised to bring mental health issues elite, ath elite athletes face to the forefront. It focuses on getting the sports industry talking about the importance of mental health in building the resilience professional athletes require to excel in their careers and beyond. Um, we'll certainly have um, some of today's speakers represented at the conference and they'll be able to speak um, certainly at greater length uh, and there will be further speakers from a variety of different sporting bodies as well. Um, we also have a uh, exclusive webinar discount code for you. Um, so we have an early bird ticket price which has been expended to the 16th of June uh, and if you quote the code which I think is coming up on the next slide that will give you there we go that will give you an additional discount um, both on the student ticket price but also the uh, the standard delegate ticket price as well so uh, please do make a record of that and, and share it with your friends and colleagues um, as you can see there are a variety of specific specific outcomes we're hoping achieve from the conference um, as well so we look forward to welcoming you here in July um, just one final word, which is sort of thank you for dialing in. Um, we will ensure that you have copies of the webinar, and my apologies for, for losing the sound for a couple of minutes throughout that. Um, please do spread the word. Obviously, we, will, we have been tweeting throughout, and I think once we've all taken our headphones off, we'll be retweeting as well to our networks. Um, and I look forward to uh, meeting you soon. Thank you very much indeed.